Hello and welcome to another Habits by Republica talk. Today we have an important subject on the agenda. We are talking about sexual education. My guests are Lean Arts, uh, he's the president of Swiss Society of uh, Sexology, and Celine Brockman, uh, who currently works at the Department of Genetic Medicine and Development University of Geneva. Um, so hello and thank you for being here with us. Hello. Hello. My first question, just to break the ice, is uh, a cliche one, maybe. Uh, does the G-point exist or is it a myth? I think we can both answer. Maybe I start with the body and then Lynn can go on uh, with anatomy since I am a, a biologist and I'm not a medical doctor or a sexologist. Uh, th there have been many studies uh, trying to find the G-spot uh, in the body by looking at uh, anatomical specimen and no one has ever found a structure that is particular that could be a G-point uh, and um, it's basically an anat anatomical region and maybe I'll leave uh, Lynn to explain uh, uh, what, uh, where it is and how it works. <laughs> Well, what we know now is that uh, um, you have the, the vagina and the urethra is on top of the vagina and over the urethra you have the clitoris. So uh, what, what is very important is that the clitoris is just not, the, it's not only the little gland that we see at the outside of the vulva, but it's much larger. Uh, it's like about 10 centimeters. Uh, so it's like a, the size of a penis, but inside of the, 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 inside of the women's body. And it goes around the vagina and around the uh, urethra. And that's what we call the urethra vagina clitoral complex. And the fact that the urethra and the clitoris is that uh, nearby the, the vagina, that probably gives this sensation, uh, this hypersensation uh, uh, in the vagina. And probably is that what people called uh, the, the G spot. Uh, so it's mainly the clitoris that is really nearby the vagina that causes this uh, this nice feeling in the vagina. I understand. There are so many taboos related to sexual organs, especially related to the vulva. Why is that? Um, I think in one word, patriarchy. <laughs> but, but, um, but. Um, I would say that uh, basically women's female bodies have been less studied uh, over the centuries. Uh, female anatomy in general, female biology, uh, even in uh, the research on the evolution of female genitalia, like female uh, sex organs, not in human, but in animals, for example, there is less knowledge um, so there has been a lot of uh, gender stereotype in society uh, against women because women are have less power than men since always and scientists have traditionally been uh, male uh, professors in universities, researchers. Uh, now, of course, it is changing. And so uh, there is mis misconception, uh, a lack of knowledge on female bodies uh, in general. I would say this is the main reason. I don't know if uh, Lynn, you would agree. Yeah. Yes, I, I totally agree. And I, what I would add is that uh, we have not learned to touch or to watch uh, our body, uh, especially girls, uh, uh, the vulva, vagina. It's, it's, it's not that visible as a penis. So we, not, we, we do not learn to wash it, to see it every day like, like a boy. Uh, so I think that's also part why uh, there are so many taboos around the vulva, vagina, etc. Uh, there are many taboos, there are many myths can, and many misconceptions. I was wondering if you can give us some example of that. And also I wanted to uh, invite you to talk a little bit about masturbation, uh, boys versus girls female bodies versus male bodies. Maybe I can start with uh, some, some biology, uh, some myth, and then maybe Lynn can be more in, in uh, the practices or clinical aspects. Uh, in, in biology, uh, we know that in the embryology, 
uh, penis and clitoris are analogous organs. So when babies or fetuses grow in uh, the mother's womb, they have the same genital organs for a while, for the first two, three months of development. And then these organs will uh, be modified, uh, which are the same in everyone, will be modified. And so that it's basically a similar organ, but uh, with a bit of a different shape. And there is some myth, for example, in um, I'm talking about in countries where uh, the practice of excision is conducted in some countries. There are very different kinds of excision. So female genital mutilation, it's a practice that is driven by social norms to uh, modify uh, surgically uh, the external organs of uh, female uh, babies. Uh, and or young girls uh, between birth until 14, depending on where it is. It is not just to say it is not linked to religion, but it's really a social practice. And, and in some countries, there are some myths that justify this practice, which is harmful uh, to, to sexual and reproductive health of women, uh, that justify this pra practice on a myth that the clitoris will grow into a penis if you don't um, cut it, basically. That is one kind of a myth. It's not everywhere like that, but in some places, in some contexts, this myth uh, sort of justifies the fact that you need to cut it to control like female uh, sexuality, basically. I don't know if Lynn, you have- uh, I, would, I, would, I would like to talk about two other myths maybe. Uh, um... Then the, the myth of masturbation, uh, that masturbation is bad, that uh, it will cause diseases. Uh, um, I think that's something we already know that that is not true. Uh, I think masturbation is uh, more something positive. You learn to explore your body, you learn to explore what you like. Uh, and I think knowledge uh, leads to pleasure. Um, so I think that's one of the myths that uh, um, that's probably still there, but uh, very important to, uh, how do you say that, counterbalance it. Um, and another very important uh, myth that, uh, uh, that I certainly want to talk about it is, is pain. Um, what I often hear, I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm a vulva specialist and I see a lot of women with, uh, with sexual pain, so pain during sexual intercourse. And I think there's still this myth that, uh, well, women are having pain during sexual contact, it's normal. Um, and that's something that I hear that uh, women uh, uh, teach each other that uh, they talk about it and say, I have pain, I have pain, oh, it's normal. But even uh, medical doctors that say that, well, you're in a menopause, you're, you have pain, you just have to accept it. So this accepted this pain uh, during sexual contact, uh, that's something that it shouldn't be there. Uh, sexual contact may not be painful. Um, so that's, um, again, a myth or something that we... Uh, we accept as women, uh, we accept having pain during uh, our period, we accept pa have during, pain during our labor, we accept having pain during sexual contact. And that's something we may not accept because it's not normal to have, uh, to have pain. So that's something we really have to work, <laughs> uh, work about to, to change this idea that uh, having pain, uh, that it is normal for women. It feels like a punishment. Yeah, a punishment. Uh, it's like uh, you have to accept it. It's part of your life. Deal with it. Uh, I always say, if there would be so many, uh, so much pain in men, we would have had uh, plenty of uh, treatments already. But again, that's the the lack of uh, research and, uh, and and attention to uh, to the female body. I think. But isn't it also? Um... I don't know, um, a habit of uh, women. I mean, are they, ash are they ashamed of that? Why don't they speak about that? Why don't they get some treatment? Mm -hmm. Why don't yeah. we? I think talking about sexuality is not, it's not easy. It's not easy to talk about sexuality with your friends, even with your partner. It's often difficult because it's a very sensitive uh, subject. And then talking to uh, to a health professional uh, about s sexual problems, it's not easy neither, especially if you feel that the health professional is not very keen to discuss sexuality. 
So I think it's the job of the health professional uh, to ask questions about sexuality, to, to, to show that you're, you're, you're open to discuss every sexual problem uh, uh, or sexual, uh, sexual questions. Uh, so it's very difficult for, for persons to start this discussion during a clinic uh, with a health professional that's uh, watch, watching the hour. And I have still 10 minutes to do my clinic. So I think it's really up to the, the health professional to start this uh, discussion about this subject. If I can add something to that, I think it's uh, important that health professional, but also adults in general around young people, and then of course in adulthood, to talk about sexual pleasure. Why is it so hard to talk about sexuality? Why is it such a difficult topic and such a taboo, like a social taboo, when you think about it? And uh, it, there are studies that show that uh, in education, whether in school or um, in university, like to become doctors, uh, sexual sexuality in general, sexual pleasure, or the physiology, what happens in the body in regards to sexual pleasure and uh, orgasm and excitation and everything, it's not taught. What is taught is a lot about reproduction, about uh, preventing uh, pregnancies or, or diseases, but not so much talking about addressing pleasure as a topic and actually uh, talking about all the activities in the body that are linked to pleasurable sex and not to reproduction. And, and I think that if we change a little bit, and that's what we are trying to do in Geneva University and in schools in Geneva Canton, like in the state of Geneva, is to really bring the conversation to uh, parents, to uh, teachers, to medical students, so that they have um, uh, information already from young age on uh, that is open about all these aspects of sexuality. Uh, and so we, we are creating content, uh, like uh, especially today we are, actually it's today the, the day, we've been working on it for three years, that we are opening uh, to the public, I mean, to a series of beta testers, uh, an online course that will address these questions at a professional level for teachers, uh, sex educators, and medical professional. It's like an online e-learning, uh, scientific and uh, interdisciplinary around also the you know, pleasurable aspects of sexuality. So I think that will help also your initiative to talk about it, to do groups of talk, to do podcasts, to, you know, in the media, to open the conversation that will help uh, to have uh, actually talk about sex just like any other topic that you talk in the family in uh, education of children or whatnot. Um, how was the information received until now by students and young people and uh, parents and teachers? Because in Romania, there is this, uh, this uh, kind of habit that everyone prefers not to talk about it. We don't talk about it. It doesn't exist. But also we have the most, uh, the, the higher rate of uh, underage mothers in the EU. So I would say that, um, first of all, uh, we know that sex education, it's knowledge since uh, 40 years, there are studies that show that if you have sex education in a life course manner in schools, for children in an age appropriate manner that you talk about things, you know, in regards to the development of children. Uh, it reduces the rate of uh, uh, teen pregnancies. It reduces the rate of uh, sexual uh, uh, transmitted okay. infections. Uh, it, it reduces violence uh, among uh, teenagers. I mean, it has positive effects on everything. So not talking about this, or saying that abstinence is the best way doesn't work. I mean, scientifically, we know it doesn't work. So you, sex education is something that uh, is now promoted by UNESCO, by the World Health Organization, by UNICEF, by you know, all the international organization really promote a sex positive, pleasure centered, uh, holistic approach to sex ed. So that's just the context to say that you know, all the countries 
move at their own rate and there are cultural barriers, there are many barriers, but I think it always takes somebody like you, uh, like us, to open the conversation and maybe people uh, who start projects that crack a little bit of uh, something that was closed and then small by small it will, you know, it will improve. So, so I mean, and in, in regards to your first question about the reactions of people, I mean, I've been doing this now since 2017 and far and foremost, what I hear is positive turn uh, turnout of what we do. Uh, teenagers, children, even parents, uh, teachers, uh, medical students who come back to us with positive. They are like, finally, we are talking about this. Finally, we address also LGBTIQ uh, issues in medical school. Finally, you know, the, like we need to talk about this and now we feel good about talking about this. There are some resistance. There are always some resistance, but far and foremost, I would say that the, the return is positive because the youth is growing and they are changing. And the old ones who are very against it, they are getting older <laughs> and somehow the youth are pushing and all this is moving to me, I see in the right direction. And of course there are some turn backs, but I think that mostly um, we haven't heard much. I mean, the only time I heard one mother who came back to the school saying, oh, my son talked about um, squirting, <laughs> about, uh, you know, female ejaculation squirting um, at home. And he learned that in this workshop that Mrs. Brockman is doing. And, you know, if a child asks a question, uh, I will try to answer it the best we can with scientific knowledge. Uh, I'm not talking about pornography or anything. I'm just talking about studies that have been done that study this phenomena of squirting. And so I answered very uh, simply the question according to the best evidence that we have today. And so to me, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so, you know, she never came back and, you know, she was probably happy to learn about it anyway. <laughs> I was wondering how uh, how does the watching uh, pornographic movies or change sexual habits? Is it helpful until it's not? Because from my point of view, and please uh, tell me if it's that so or not. Uh, you, when you are in the living with all kinds of lacks of information about sexual education, you can get some infos out of there, but there is a thin line. Mm -hmm. I, I think we were all very uh, afraid about the impact of pornography on the sexual, uh, sexual uh, evolution uh, or the sexual uh, development of us, or certainly young people. Uh, um, I agree. We have uh, we have to be careful. Uh, I think it has. You have to have information that is age uh, that is uh, come, how do you say that that is uh, age related. Huh? So, but otherwise, what we see from studies now is that uh, pornography doesn't have uh, uh, an, uh, a very negative impact on sexuality in general. Uh, we see that there are more positive impacts uh, on sexuality, on sexual function, sexual uh, sexual pleasure, etc. Um, so I think this big fear that we had, uh, it doesn't, it isn't shown in studies. But of course, we have to be uh, careful that what we show to your, especially young young uh, young people. I don't know if you agree with that, uh, Celine. I can add something. I totally yeah. agree uh, uh, with that. What I would Add is that there is some, in fact, there is some. Um, what what some studies have shown is that uh, a lot of uh, pornography can change a bit the sexual norm, like what is normal, what is not normal in terms of behavior, or also the sexual script, uh, like what you do first, second, mm -hmm. third, fourth, 
you know, in your sexual practice. And, and maybe some kids who are not exposed to porn don't think of certain practices because they don't see it. And it's not the first thing you would think of when you enter sexuality, when you're 16, 17, 18. So it does modify the sexual norms and sexual scripts in, in young people. But there is absolutely no link that has been shown that watching porn creates violence. There's no correlation that has been shown in studies. But the, what we uh, stand for is even more sex education, because sex education will allow you to analyze and to become critical of pornography, because it is readily available. And most kids 10 years old have already seen some porn in Switzerland or in most European countries, I would imagine. And so the, the, the position is more to open the conversation again with the young people, tell them this exists, tell them that the scripts are not reality, uh, that, uh, for example, women as often is very sexist, so the women are not treated the right way in porn, or uh, there is violence that uh, is not uh, okay, or there is no consent, for example, is never discussed, consent is never discussed or even contraception or uh, you know condoms or whatever is not. So you have to like basically make the kids critical towards uh, sec uh, pornography without uh, uh, forbidding it, for forbidding it because it's, they will watch it anyways. And like, um, like Lynn said, um, it has some positive impact also. It's, it's used for masturbation, it is, you know, and that is not negative in and of itself. What you want is just kids to be critical about it and become smarter about sexuality, about the values really of consent, protection, uh, pleasure, uh, things like that. You're talking about uh, consent and uh, in Romania, this is a new concept. It's uh, it started to be uh, applied uh, in the young generations. Um, when I was 18, we didn't have consent. I mean, not so obvious. Now it's mm -hmm. all over the place. How important is that um, in having sexual relationships, but also in building a healthy relationship? I, I would start because we have done uh, what we call Café de Parents which is a, like a workshop for parents in schools in, in a collaboration with the, the Ministry of uh, Education, the Public Ministry of Education. And we offer that and we talk about, every time we talk about consent, consent is central to everything. I find it personally that is uh, uh, important in every situation of life, not just sexuality. And you can learn it. That's what we try to do in this uh, Café de Parents. You can teach it with very simple examples, simple things like when you're a child and you have to say goodbye, when you're four years old and you have to say goodbye to your grandma and people say kiss your grandma or grandpa and uh, you don't want to do that, like to, to accompany the kid, to listen to the kid saying, no, I don't want to do that. Yeah, well, people usually will say, no, you kiss your granddad because you have to, this is polite. And no, if you if you do that, you teach to the kid, there is something you're feeling in your body about you that you have to repress because it's not right. Politeness is more important than your own feeling within your body. And that's not right at all. This is not consensual. It's not consent. You can just teach to say, our values in the family is to say goodbye to people when we leave them. It's a polite way to behave. There are many ways to say goodbye. You can kiss someone, you can shake their hands, you can do high fives, you can, but thanks for telling me that kissing your granddad is not something you would like to do because I see that you understand your body and I, um, you know, I praise you that you're able to even tell it, tell me, because if you can tell me, it, if a kid can tell their parents that, then when they are older, they can uh, tell their lover that they don't want this or that. So it's really about listening to your body and being able to uh, learn the, um, the social competence and the empowerment to announce it to the outside world that this is what you feel and this is what you want or you don't want. 
So it's to me, it's central to everything in life, really, uh, consent. Uh, do you want to add something? Uh, no, I think <laughs> I totally agree with Celine. It's uh, <laughs> it's a form of respect, respect for your own body, uh, your own thoughts, uh, uh, and uh, I think with respect for your own uh, feelings comes the respect for the other people's feelings. So uh, and, and, and thoughts. So uh, I totally agree with Celine. Yeah. If we are talking about respect for uh, our bodies. How can we explain the attitude of the parents that um, use certain diminutives for the child's sexual organs? In Romania, we are uh, teaching our kids to use all sorts of naming for the sexual organs, except the anatomical ones. Mm -hmm. You, you want to answer it, uh, Celine, <laughs> you know better than... <laughs> okay. Yeah, we do We do a lot with that. It's also one of the cornerstone of what we tell the parents to do, is uh, to, to, to mention uh, anatomical words from day one. There is a vulva, there is a clitoris, there are labias, inner and outer. Uh, there is a vagina, a penis, scrotum. And uh, using those words, I mean, not using the right word, maintains a taboo because it's the only organ that you have to give a small name. And if you learn uh, when you're a child that you cannot name things, then it's a taboo. So in case you are in a situation where somebody will maybe uh, try molesting you or whatever, you will don't have the tools to somehow defend yourself. And there are some studies, a small number, but there are some studies that show that children who are able to name organs it's like a protective effect effect against uh, abuse. So it is one of the main things that uh, is, uh, you know, again, evidence-based sex education that is uh, uh, really advised by uh, people who are experts in that to name sexual organ. But I think what, what is important, is we're not only talking about children, I think a lot of adults uh, don't even know the names, the correct names of the vulva, vagina, etc. What I see in my clinic, I have like a, a sort of camera that shows the vulva and how many uh, adults that I see that, uh, that see the vulva for the first time and that I really have to explain these are the outer labia, these are the small labia, or the inner labia, this is the clitoris. So really doing education, not only for the, for the children, but also for the adults is very important because they have to learn the children the anatomy and if they don't know their own anatomy and the, the, the right words they will never learn uh, their children uh, using the right words so, so it's not only a job for children but also for the adults and isn't this a kind of uh, i don't know respect for your genital parts and therefore for <laughs> your pleasure absolutely yeah. absolutely and it's also the job of schools to do that. Sex education, but also just in biology uh, class. If some countries don't have sex education in schools, they can start in just the regular, uh, you know, regular programs uh, in primary school or in a secondary school where you learn the anatomy of the sexual organs and reproduction. Then you can have... Uh, uh, like schematic uh, drawings that are well done, that there are some that are free on our website. Uh, the, everything what, that we do is free. So people, for example, teachers in Romania who listen to your podcast can um, uh, download all these things. Uh, they can be in English or French. Uh, we don't have Romanian yet, but if you translate it, we could. But, uh, it, it, <laughs> but it's easy because it's just an anatomical chart that really show the organ the way they are with the clitoris, the penis, and the different parts that uh, Lynn mentioned. And, um, and that's it. So, you know, it could be in schools as well. And I think if you, if you know the anatomy, if it's not something mysterious or uh, you don't have to be anxious about at the moment that you have knowledge, you can start uh, exploring and that's when pleasure starts. So uh, uh, so I think it's to, to answer your question, is it important for pleasure? Yes, it's important to have the knowledge and then you can uh, 
uh, really be very reassured and exploring uh, uh, your own tempo, uh, uh, the pleasure of things. Uh, uh, it's important yeah. to be able to develop your sexuality. I don't know if you want to add something, Selina. No, I don't. I don't. It's not my specialty. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there countries where sexual health and sexual rights achievements should be an inspiration for the world? Maybe, I mean, maybe Holland, or I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he also said Holland, the Netherlands is a country that is very, very uh, uh, developed in sex research, in talking about sexuality. Uh, we see that a lot of uh, uh, renowned research come from Holland. Um, so uh, I think it can, could be an example, yes. Uh, you are talking about the LGBTQI plus community. Do you think that the lack of sex education also generates social attitudes and political ones like homophobia, transphobia? We know that in Romania, we have some several cases of transphobia, not so much homophobia these days, but uh, since 2005, you could get to jail if you were uh, having homosexual relations. I think sex education, um, I mean, has an impact on many different things. Uh, and um, in our countries, there is a, a um, let's say evidence-based uh, studies that show that LGBTIQ plus youth uh, take more, uh, use more substances than uh, addictive substances than than their counter cis, uh, you know, hetero young people uh, that they are more discriminated against. Um, there are more violence against them. They have less, uh, I mean, a uh, poorer uh, mental health. So even though uh, we are open to uh, all this and there are no laws against uh, all that, uh, we know that these youth are, have not the same health, mental and somatic as other kids the same age. It's not because of being gay, but it's really because, or being trans, but it's really because of the minority stress uh, and the violence and discrimination. So. Of course, uh, sex education that is holistic, that is positive, that uh, includes consent, respect, values, and addresses the questions of gender identity and sexual orientation uh, is definitely has positive impact. Um, the, the, the way that uh, sexual education, let's say, should be done in the gold standard as per the, the uh, UNESCO uh, documents um has positive impacts on, on that for sure um do you want to add something or we're good we're good, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> um the internet is uh, full of articles of how to reach orgasm it's a subject uh, that you can find uh, in all magazines i've read it since 15. um <laughs> What is uh, the uh, red line that connects the orgasm, the pleasure in a sexual act and all these useful tips? Are, there, uh, are, are they useful really or they just get in the way for individuals? I don't know if I- I, th I think we, we come back to the same subject. I think it's education. Education makes that you start exploring more and that you will explore what you like, uh, what excitates you. Uh, and when you find what you like and uh, where you get excited by, well, that makes that orgasm is more easily. <laughs> so I think, again, education uh, and having the, the, the ability or the, the possibility more uh, to, to explore uh, the way you want and the tempo you want, uh, I think that's important. Maybe, maybe I can add, I totally agree with Lynn about education and about the fact that pleasure should be part of the education, understanding that pleasure in, is possible in, in all bodies, uh, in different shapes without focusing necessarily on orgasm as the gold standard of pleasure 
but just pleasure in general and orgasm being part of that. Uh, I also think that um, people are very resistant to the fact that in sexuality, you can learn skills, uh, competencies that uh, just like with any other uh, learning of anything, a language or other things. And yes, of course you, you learn by exploration, but you can also learn by hearing other people talking about their experiences because you are only limited by what you have in your own head. And maybe that's what you need right now, but maybe if you hear someone talking about uh, the way, um, you know, for example, I will give you a very specific example. Uh, there is a podcast that I recommend to anybody who speaks English that is done by two very sex positive uh, persons. They are a couple. It's called, um, they are called the pleasure mechanics. It's free. You can listen to it. Uh, it's called speaking of sex with the pleasure mechanics. And um, I will, can I go into a, a detail about a practice? It's okay. Would, is it okay if I talk about a particular practice? Okay. So, <laughs> so there are probably 450 episodes of this podcast. And I always talk about it because they have values of consent, of uh, uh, sex positivity, of uh, protection, safe, safer sex, et cetera. So it's very positive. But pleasure, they address pleasure in a very uh, frontal way. And they, they talk about, in one episode, they talk about uh, uh, cunilagus, so oral sex, okay, for people with vulva. And uh, so they talk about the fact that a lot of people cannot reach orgasm with oral sex because with the tongue, the pressure is not strong enough. Like it's very nice but it's just not strong enough. A lot of people with vulva come back to in, in, in conversations to say that it's hard to get an orgasm. And so they talk about this very openly and say that it is known that for a lot of people with vulva, mm -hmm. you need a certain pressure on the clitoris. And that is why uh, uh, the, the um, sex toys are very efficient in creating an orgasm because they vibrate and pressure the clitoris in a specific mechanical way that is very powerful. And so it's kind of hard not to get there maybe with a, you know. And so they say in that podcast, they talk about the fact that the people cannot use only their tongue, but they can use their hands or can even use other parts of the face that is like the, the, the chin or the cheek or the forehead. <laughs> and that basically with that, uh, you can reach orgasm is with the easier because you are not limited to this tongue that is only so strong. I mean, it's not such a strong muscle. So to me, to talk about it like this, it's very freeing because it's, it's not to me, a lot of times in sexuality, when you listen to people talk about their sexuality, if they do, if they dare talking about it, they will think that they are broken, that especially women, that they don't, they are not good enough or they have a problem or they uh but when you come to matter of fact talks like that then it can be very helpful for women and you know save them years of you know <laughs> very <laughs> nice for all sex if that's something they want to do i'm not talking about the fact that everybody should have sex all the time and do you know everyone should listen to their own uh needs and so some people don't want to have sex and that's totally okay and some people want to have a lot of sex some a little bit and all that is okay uh, but there are ways to learn about it if you are free and in desire to learn about it oh, thank you for the example it was it was a, a very good one um I think we are reaching the end and I just wanted to ask you if you have something to add, something I didn't think about asking you and you feel it's important. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I think maybe Lynn, there is something medical about some things that you want to add on my side. I would just uh, add uh, that and it's not something that has to be added uh, live in your in the talk, but maybe you could put the link 
to the website where we have these anatomical charts and these videos and stuff that are free for people to use. Because I, to me, the reason why we do that is, <laughs> is just for people to use them and it's all free. So it can be helpful maybe for some people. Well, they were helpful for me when I was documenting this interview. <laughs> No, I think the work that you're doing that's that's perfect. That's what that's what that we need. Uh, that women need. Uh, uh, not, well, not only women, but uh, I think um, even when it's just a small part in the in the education, I think it's important. So if um, more people do these things, uh, sex will be something more easily discussable. I think. Yeah. And maybe maybe I could ask something, uh, add something in regard to being inclusive. And when I mean, we have talked a lot about women and about the lack of knowledge, et cetera, because there is a gap. And so we need to fill that gap. But I think that it's nice to include everyone in the conversation and to include a man, to include uh, of any gender, of any orientation into the conversation and not uh, stay, um, I think, you know, stay, um, uh, again, like to me, the future is not female, but the future is inclusive. And we, it's nice to try to always address all bodies and, and all genders and all orientation at the same time in our conversation, because we are much less different than biologically, our bodies uh, are much less different than they are similar. You know, they are very similar in their functioning. And so the difference in the sexuality between men and women uh, is often, you know, stated that it's so different and women are complicated. But I think that it's really a lot about trying to talk about all this in an inclusive way uh, with men, women, non-binary, and and all all people. Yes, I I totally agree. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Vă mulțumim că ne-ați urmărit, sperăm că v-a fost de folos și vă invităm în comunitatea noastră a Societății Omului Sănătos.